Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Praminder Raina. I am the scientific director of McMaster Institute for Research on Aging, and also the lead principal investigator of the Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging. It is my pleasure to welcome you to this discussion with Dr. Mara Marcucci from the Faculty of Health Sciences and in partnership with the Socrates Project and the McMaster alumni. I'm sure this is a bit of a strange way to be listening to a presentation, but these are unprecedented times and we are doing, all of us are doing our best to manage through these difficult times. And, and today's talk that we are gonna hear from Mara is going to be on that topic. Just to give you a bit of a background about the McMaster Institute for Research on Aging, or what we call it as MIRA, is a university-wide institute what, and was created in 2016 to support interdisciplinary research in aging at McMaster and, uh, and all across Hamilton. Our focus is to boost research excellence, build capacity among our trainees, develop partnerships and collaborations, and work closely with older adults and other stakeholders to make sure that our research outcomes are as impactful as possible for today's aging population. And this current situation of COVID-19 has actually made us even more nimble that many of our projects that are happening are looking at issues of impact of COVID-19 on the aging population here in Hamilton and across the country and globally. The Socrates project launched in 2018 with a goal of deepening connections between the university and our wider society. It is a hub for interdisciplinary collaboration, similar to what Mira does, creative exploration and public engagement with the pressing issues of our time. And I guess one of the most pressing issue of our time is COVID-19. Many of us probably will never live long enough to see another one of this event. One of today's most pressing issue is how the COVID-19 pandemic is impacting older adults. Older adults have suffered more because of COVID-19 than any other segment of the population. And the impact of the virus isn't limited to those who just contract it. And, and one of the most amazing things that this has brought to the forefront, this whole issue of COVID-19 is that it has shined light on inequities, that it affects people very differently, people in low socioeconomic uh, uh, conditions, older people, people of particular ethnic race and background. And, and many of us are dealing with all sorts of uh, issues around race, uh, race COVID-19, injustice. And, and you will hear some of those topics today uh, from Mara as she talks about how it is actually impacting the, the health of older people, especially people who have not experienced COVID. Health services interruption, social distancing, and general refrain for seeking help for fear of infection, these all have consequences on the physical and mental well-being of our older population. Over the next hour, Dr. Mara Marcucci, Assistant Professor of Medicine and member of my department that I belong to, Health Research Methods, Evidence and Impact at McMaster, will lead an online discussion highlighting some of these uh, consequences. She will also discuss any opportunities that exist as a result of these consequences. From a research perspective, there are opportunities to learn and gather tools in order to better pre be prepared either in recovery face of the pandemic or in similar future situations. The format of this evening's presentation is that Maura will take some time to do her presentation after that, I will moderate and ask some questions of Mara, and then we will open up these questions, uh, question answer sessions with the general audience on, on, the, on the Zoom. And I also wanted to thank all of you because you're all so well behaved and obeying all the rules of this pandemic that you have joined us virtually. And it is because of many of you and your efforts that we are seeing the benefits of reduction in COVID-19 related diseases and serious consequences. 
And now we are in the next phase. All the things that have been interrupted because of this in our healthcare system, how we are going to bring those things back and provide our usual care to people who need it. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Mara Marcucci. And Mara, it's all over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Praminder, for the great introduction. I'm going to share my screen right now so that I can share my presentation with everybody. Hope you can see my, my screen well. And I start thanking again Parminder, Mira, and the Socrates Project for this opportunity. I really hope that you will enjoy my talk at least 30% as much as I enjoyed preparing this talk for you uh, tonight. And the title of my talk, as you, as you know, is COVID-19 and its impact on older non-COVID-19 patients. Sorry, I'm just trying to, okay. And just to break the ice a little bit, I'm gonna start with three stories. And I try to give a, a title to each of these stories. So the first story is not really something that I hear myself, it's something that a colleague of mine just told me uh, one week, one week ago. He was on the telephone with his in-laws, okay, just checking in in this crazy times. And his in-laws are, people now around the 70s that were uh, immigrates from uh, Europe about uh, 50 years ago. So they were in Europe during the Second World War. And so my colleague and his wife were curious and they were asking them, they were talking of course about these crazy times and they were asking, do you think that, that these times, these COVID-19 pandemics is really doing something to the world very similar to the Second World War? And they in law is responding, I think you're right. I think there, there is some, some commonalities between the two uh, events. However, there is one important difference. During the Second World War, we didn't have social distancing. The second story is the what day is today story. And this is about a patient of mine, a patient that I'm following virtually. This is a post cardiac surgery uh, patients. And one day in one of our uh, uh, calls, I, I had the perception that the patient was not feeling okay. So I was trying to understand if the patient was confused, if the patient had what we call uh, delirium. So I asked the wife, who is the patient's primary caregiver, I asked her, do you think that Bob is a little bit confused? And did you try to ask him uh, what day is today? And the patient's wife responded to me, Doctor, I don't know what day is today. With this COVID-19, I really lost track myself about time. And the third story is about my father, about my father. My father is a 73 years old gentleman living right now in Italy. I'm from, I'm from Italy, in the center of Italy. He has a past medical history significant for two heart attacks. And he's now in the middle of the pandemic, of the social distancing. He can't really leave the house. He's a very high risk patient to get very sick if it gets the COVID-19 infection. However, his hair is really growing, growing. He can't stand this long hair. And one day, he sneaks out of the house without telling my mother anything. He goes to the barber's house and asks the guy, I really need a hard cut. And the barber brings my father to his backyard and he does here cut there. So this is what I'm going to, to talk about in the next 15, 20, maybe 25 minutes. I'm going to try to give you some evidence of the impact of the pandemic on older people not affected by COVID-19. Try to talk a little bit about the proved and potential mechanism with which this impact is happening. And then at the end of the talk, I'm gonna give you some examples of research projects related to this topic. I'm starting actually with, with these, and I think that everybody that is listening to me tonight would agree that the COVID-19 infection and the SARS-CoV-2 has been a massacre of older people. I'm showing you 
data from Public Health Ontario, but I could show you probably data from any country in the world, maybe multiply times 10, 20, maybe even more than that. But the, graph, the graphs would look the same. The first graph is showing you the age distribution of COVID-19 cases. The second graph is showing you the age distribution of COVID-19 deaths. And what these are really telling us is that everybody can get the infection. However, the infection is mainly killing older people. As Perminder was saying, epidemics being unequal is not really surprising. This is not really unique to COVID-19 pandemic. However, this is, everybody would agree, still very, very impressive. However, this is not what I'm going to talk tonight, talk about tonight. I'm showing you a next slide. And this next slide is showing you data from New York City area. But again, this is just an example. I could use probably data from somewhere else. And the graph is showing the excess mortality that in New York City, they have been observing during the peak of the pandemic, March 11, May the 2nd, 2020. The excess mortality is measured compared to the a seasonal baseline, which is basically the expected number of deaths based on historical data on the same uh, year period. And what the graph is telling us is that, of course, there was an excess in mortality. Nobody would argue about that. However, COVID-19 probable or confirmed deaths were only explaining a portion of this excess mortality. 22% of the deaths in excess were actually not due to COVID-19 infection. Now, these type of data, of course, have limitations because what we are showing here is just a temporal association. So we don't really know if this excess in mortality is due to something happening during the time of the COVID-19 pandemic. Moreover, the limitation is also due to the fact that most likely at least a portion of these non-COVID-19 deaths is in fact COVID-19 deaths in people having other comorbidities but who were not tested for COVID-19. However, I think this is really telling us that something is happening to non-COVID-19 patients. And of course, the excess mortality graph here is not showing an, ed an age distribution, but I don't have any reason to expect that this excess mortality happen in young people. So now in the talk, I'm trying to summarize and simplify a little bit what I think are the main mechanisms proved or potential through which the COVID-19 pandemic is having an impact in older people not affected by COVID-19. And the three mechanisms I'm gonna talk about tonight are risk avoidance behaviors, cancellation or deferral of healthcare services, and physical and social distancing. What do I mean with risk avoidance behaviors? To explain this to you, I'm now taking the perspective of this author of this article, a recent article published on the New England Journal Medicine, Journal of Medicine Catalyst. This author is comparing the COVID-19 pandemic with other dread risks, like 9-11, so the September 11 terrorist attacks to the Twin Towers, or any other uh, dread risk like the uh, Haiti earthquake. What are dread risks? Are low probability events. Fortunately, these events do not happen quite often. However, when they happen, they kill many, many people. Often with this perception that this is happening beyond our control. And another typical characteristic of dread, or dread risks is that they often come with terrifying news. News that are terrifying because, through images or through numbers, which is actually what is happening uh, right now during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Now, dread risks, these events trigger extreme reaction due to fear of something happening to them of risk avoidance, which can lead to very bad outcomes. The author of this article is saying 
outcome that are even worse than the outcomes that the uh, occurrence of the same event again would lead to. And he's making the example of the 9-11. Uh, uh, After the 9-11, in the US, they register a substantial 20% reduction in use of domestic flights. US uh, residents would usually use domestic flights to do longer distance travel within US. However, most likely because of the fear of, again, ha having one of, the, being one of the victims of a next terrorist attack on uh, using airplanes, and with the perception to have a better control of our car, people were just avoiding to use domestic flights, and they were doing these long uh, uh, distance travels using their own car. Now, we all know, it's very known, that it's much more likely that I'm going to die because of a car accident than because of an airplane crash. And it's far more likely that I'm going to die for an, a car accident than on a plane involved in a terrorist attack. However, these happen. And in the first year after the terrorist attacks, they registered 1,600 excess, excess dates in car accidents compared to the historical data. So then the author move on and try to explain the comparison showing this type of graph, which is again a graph that is specifically talking about a region in uh, Germany, the uh, Rosening uh, uh, region, with a, which is a region close to the north of Italy, which has been experienced many outbreaks during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. But again, this is just an example. And what the graph is showing is that after the start of the pandemics, while they were seeing the increase in numbers of people being admitted, admitted to the hospital with COVID-19 patients, they see a dramatic drop in the number of visits to the emergency department compared to what they would expect based on 2019 data. 23% drop overall, even more impressive, 50% drop in visits from patients suffering from severe heart condition, suffering of some uh, surgical emergency, or suffering from advanced, an, ad an advanced cancer. Patients are not going to the emergency department. And so this is most, li most likely a risk avoidance behavior. Even if as the, the court is saying, we're telling patients we are here 24 seven. On the same line, these are data coming from, from Italy. They uh, have been published on the New England Journal of Medicine. Again, another, the, the highest impact factor journal for uh, us doing some research in internal medicine, only medicine in general. And these data are the results of a study conducted by the um, Italian Society of Cardiology. And these are reporting the drop in the daily hospital admissions for heart attacks, what we call technically acute coronary syndromes in cardiology units in the north of Italy. These here, the numbers are reported as the number of daily admissions. And so based on two control periods, the month right before the onset of the pandemic and the same time of the, of the year, so uh, February, uh, April of 2019, we would expect about 18, 19 patients admitted to the hospital because of a heart attack. Why what, we, what they have seen during the pandemic is a number of 13 patients, a significant drop. And interesting enough, they are also showing their data splitting these uh, uh, results, these findings, based on the severity of the heart attack. So we have this way of classifying heart attacks and the STEMI are those heart attacks that, that are more life-threatening, where NSTEMI are usually less severe, or let's say associated with a lower mortality in the next, in the, in the first hours or, or days. So the drop did involve mainly 
the less severe heart attacks, but also involved the life-threatening heart attacks. Not only what these uh, uh, researchers and, and clinicians saw is that even among those that eventually came to the hospital and were admitted to the cardiology unit, something will happen. They saw a 39% increase in time from symptoms onset to when they were able to bring the patient to the cat lab and treat their coronaries. So patients that eventually came to the hospital came after some hesitation. And most likely because of that, they also saw a more than 10% increase in mortality in those admitted to the cardiology units. Now, I think that even more interesting are these other data that, are, that actually come from the same study because the study was actually conducted not only in north of Italy, which you know is the part of Italy that as everybody knows has been mainly involved in the pandemic, dramatically involved in the pandemic, but also in hospitals in the center and in the south of Italy. And in the same, during the same uh, uh, time period compared to 2019, the reduction in admissions for heart attack was absolutely the same even in hospital in the south and center of Italy. Another, another impressive data is that actually the dramatic drops in uh, hospital admissions did involve also other potentially life-threatening uh, cardiac conditions like heart failure, atrial fibrillation, pulmonary embolism, and malfunctioning of pacemakers or defibrillators. So going back to the New York data, um, this is actually the same type of graph that I showed you at the beginning that was um, uh, in fact published more recently, a couple of days ago, and actually Perminder uh, shared with me this art article, and thank you Perminder. Now, it's not only talking about New York, but also New Jersey data, so the absolute date numbers might be a little bit different, but what, where I wanted uh, to drive your attention is that now they're also reporting the causes of deaths in the excess deaths not due to COVID-19. And we are seeing what we would imagine. So 15% of these excess deaths, not COVID-19 deaths, were actually due to heart disease and diabetes. There were also other respiratory disease. So something expected. And again, it's possible that some of these patients were actually also positive, but we didn't know because we didn't test. And we just assumed that the underlying heart condition was the reason for their death. But I think even more uh, impressing is the fact that in the same time, in the same time period, they also observed a 60% increase in deaths from Alzheimer's disease compared to their historical data. So there are definitely vulnerable populations that are experiencing an impact from the pandemic. The second mechanism through which I, I think uh, we are seeing an impact on uh, older people is the cancellation or deferral of healthcare services. It was April the 2nd, 2020, when myself as one of the HHS employee, employees received this uh, communication, what is called COVID-19 update, from the chief operations officers sharing with us the capacity planning, the plan to try to increase the hospital capacity to face the pandemic. And one of the main parts of the, of the planning is the ramp down of known essential or known priority services and scheduled procedures. And I'm sure I'm very certain when I say that this is happening here, but this is happening in every hospital in the world. Every hospital in the world has been planning for the worst while hoping for the best. Now, is this having an impact on our people? Is having a surgery for your uh, health condition delayed, deferred, canceled, postponed, sometimes to an undetermined time, is having an impact on my health? 
Now, I think that everybody here that is talking to my talk tonight is most likely, most likely has experienced themselves some consequences of these deferral of services during the COVID-19 pandemic. And unfortunately, because of the time I have available, I can't really talk about each and every experience of ours. So I'm now uh, taking, two, as an example, two settings that have been affected that I think are, uh, are going to be very paradigmatic. And I'm starting from the oncology and oncohematology uh, setting. And I'm starting from that because I think this is really an example on how the capacity planning forced a change in our healthcare provision. I'm reporting here a quote that was published on this article, again, in the New England Journal of Medicine, about a colleague of mine in hematology that was saying, our practice of medicine has changed more in one week than in my previous 20 years combined. What's happening is that they have been forced to adopt triage systems and literally new treatment protocols to try to identify what treatment could be deferred and in what patient and what alternative treatment could be offered. Now, of course, there are some uh, care provided to cancer patients that, of course, has not been part of the known essential services that have been uh, deferred. However, this is not, uh, uh, unfortunately, the only thing that has been happening. Now, this interesting article that I'm citing here, uh, published on, on, on JAMA, whose title is actually the oncology practice during the COVID-19 pandemic here, is also saying that this change in practice that have been forced to uh, undertake has had actually positive consequences. And I, and I can confirm that even if I'm not a, an oncologist or hematologist. This has forced us to choose wisely. We have been um, foregoing treatments. There are actually low value treatments that we have been adopting just routinely as a routine practice, even if there is no clear evidence of, of, of their benefits. And the second positive consequence that, again, I can definitely confirm is that these days we have seen an increase in the communications and collaboration across different specialists and disciplines to try to combine our efforts to find the best solution in this uh, specific circumstances. However, the uncertainty of the consequences of this change in practice remains. And briefly, there are also other two potential mechanisms through which the lockdown is possibly, in the lockdown, especially particularly in oncology, is possibly affecting um, our older people's health. One is the interruption of clinical trials, which might mean nothing in certain circumstances, but here specifically in the oncology and oncohematology setting, might mean a lot. There are patients with advanced malignancy or some types of malignancy for which we already know that unfortunately there are no proved working treatments. And these patients have been basically treated with experimental drugs, drugs that are tested in clinical trials, hoping that these drugs will eventually work. Now these patients are not receiving these drugs anymore because as you know, research has been mainly stopped, especially those types of clinical trials that do require recruiting patients in person, having the patient consent in person. And the second mechanism is the interruption of cancer screening programs. Of course, these are not considered priority services at these times. We don't really know if they will eventually, if the interruption will eventually have an impact at the population level. The second setting I'm gonna talk about is more my own setting. Um, I'm an internist, but I also, uh, I'm also um, interested and I'm working in perioperative medicine. So I'm looking after patients that had their surgery, different types of surgery from the medical perspective. So as I mentioned, what has been happening everywhere is the cancellation of elective procedures. And just to give you some number, uh, some numbers, I'm now using this article recently published on the British Journal of Surgery that is showing the best estimates. So it's, a, it's an article based on projections 
for elective operation cancelled during the peak 12 weeks of the COVID-19 pandemic worldwide. And even if with different absolute numbers, it's clear that many, many elective operations uh, have been cancelled everywhere. And just to give you numbers that uh, uh, concern us here in Canada and in Ontario, based on the uh, Financial Accountability Office, the estimate is that from the start of the lockdown, of the, the start of the um, capacity planning to mid June, there is an estimate of about 400,000 surgeries that have been or will be canceled across Canada and 50,000 in Ontario specifically. And another interesting piece of the picture that this article is giving, again, is based on modeling, but according to their modeling, let's say that this pandemic eventually stop, eventually stops. And they say that post pandemic, even if countries increase their normal surgical volume by 20%, still it would take a median of 45 weeks, so somewhere also basically up to one year to clear the black lock. Now, is this having an impact on our patients that uh, have seen their surgery defer? So just to reassure you, the same article is showing what are the main reasons for surgeries, for those surgeries that have been deferred. And as expected, again, because we're talking about non-priority, uh, non-emergency uh, surgeries, the large majority of the surgeries that have been deferred were surgeries for benign conditions, okay? And why surgery for cancer really was only a small proportion of the uh, surgeries deferred, again, with inequalities across, across regions, which I, have not, I don't have time to talk about, but they are always very sad. But it, let's say, in general, small proportion of the first surgeries were surgeries for cancer. Now, this, however, doesn't really mean that the benign conditions that we're expecting their surgeries are not still potentially life-threatening. And this brings to this news that I'm sure 100%, the large majority of you have, have read on the newspaper. This is about the uh, Ministry of Health, our Ministry of Health, um, earlier talking, reporting these uh, findings from a study that was conducted in, in Toronto that it's based on, again, modeling. So based on historical data, they estimated that because of a delay in cardiac surgeries due to the pandemic, 30, 35 uh, deaths might, may have occurred. Again, this is historical data. These deaths are not individuals with a name or last name, but most likely this has happened. And again, it's very impressive. However, I'm gonna, a little bit change the perspective of my talk, talk. I think this is the moment, the turning moment in my, in my talk. I don't think that the impact on mortality that the pandemic is having in non-COVID-19 patients is the only thing that matters. And I'm sure that this is not the only thing that matters to older people. Older people do care about the impact of something on their function cognitive function, physical function, their ability to do what we define in a technical way, activity of daily living. This is what they really care about. So is the deferral of surgery having an impact on the old, older patient's ability to function? And four to three months, my answer is now, I don't know. I can't answer to this question right now. What I can uh, bring to your attention is more some um, indirect evidence of the possible impact of deferring services in general on people's uh, 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 important outcomes, okay? So for example, we do know that there are, even outside the pandemic, there are people that uh, are waiting for months, sometimes for years, for 
receiving their major joint surgery, uh, major orthopedic surgery. I'm reporting here, I'm citing here, old study, 2005, published on the Canadian Journal of Surgery. And the study was really conducted in the contest, these are, again, 15 years ago, in which Canada and Ontario was really trying to uh, solve these issues of very long waiting time for orthopedic, orthopedic surgeries. And this study is reporting that about 50% of patients ranked their weight as contributing to the deterioration of their health. Another interesting uh, finding that I didn't report here is that they actually, when people were asked for how long they had been waiting before receiving their surgery, the time that these patients would give was not exactly the time they really had, wait, had been waiting for, which really uh, gives a sense of how stressful could be that situation. And another indirect evidence that I'm bringing to you is the evidence from people with chronic pain that are waiting for their assessment. The literature is, is uh, quite rich in showing that while waiting for their assessment, people with chronic pain do experience severe levels of pain. They do experience an, uh, an impact on their quality of life, more severe levels of depression and also societal thinking. Now, all these studies are really not talking about objectively measured impact on objectively measured functions, okay? However, so these are all what we call patient reported outcomes. However, we do care about what uh, our patients uh, report to us. And I also think that even if what I've told, what I've told you uh, so far about the impact of the uh, deferral of services do applies, uh, do applies to uh, older people, I think that they also deserve special considerations. A procedure that is considered elective in a young person may indeed be urgent or emergent or emergency or become an urgency or an emergency in an older adult. And I'm not talking about uh, cardiac surgeries, which are a little bit more obvious. For example, the author of this, uh, the same article that uh, I was citing before is actually making this example of an older uh, patient having a biliary uh, drainage while waiting for uh, his definitive uh, surgery, endoscopic surgery to remove is uh, uh, cholecholitis, and then finally remove the drainage. However, this is an elective surgery, not a priority surgery, and is one of the surgeries that have been delayed uh, uh, during the lockdown. This older patient is a patient with some cognitive issues, and while waiting at home with this drainage, everything could happen. The patient might pull the drainage many times. Family might not be able to, to cope with this situation, and for sure, this patient will, will end up going to the emergency department many times, and maybe with some real complications, sometimes even life-threatening. And the other special consideration that I'm sorry to, to do, and I really hope this is not going to happen, but I'm afraid this is going to happen, is that older people are also at risk of being disadvantaged when they're starting getting in line as the capacity for medical procedures becomes available, which is what, what, what is happening uh, right now, hopefully right now. The last mechanism is the physical and social distancing. And it's last, not because the least important. I actually do think that it is really playing the major role. However, I don't have any evidence that the physical and social distancing is having the, the physical and social distancing happening during the COVID-19 pandemic is having an, imp an impact on other older people. But I'm also sure 100% that this is happening. And to try to explain to you why I'm so confident, I'm using the concept of, of frailty, age-related frailty. Age-related frailty is a concept that in internal medicine, especially in geriatric medicine, we really like a lot. Frailty, age-related frailty is a way to define that condition of reduced um, reserve due to medical 
cognitive, social uh, reasons, we usually call frailty as an overall, to, to capture the impacts from uh, different uh, factors. And this uh, condition of uh, reduced uh, reserve is making older people more vulnerable to events that can trigger some dramatic uh, uh, consequences, some dramatic complications, events that in other people, younger people, would definitely not be a trigger. And even if so far I've been talking about medical conditions, about medical uh, treatments, procedures being delayed, I do think that the way older people are able to uh, live their daily lives can influence their physical and mental health much more than a medical treatment. And the way the physical and social distancing might have an impact on the physical and mental well-being of this patient are different. I, I'm making as mine this quote from again the author of the, of the article that is saying, I do think that loneliness and depression represent only the tip of the iceberg of the potential harm. For sure, during the physical and social distancing, loneliness and depressions are going to increase. However, there are other mechanisms with which the physical and social distancing might have an impact on health. For example, lack of exercise that can lead to the conditioning with subsequent weakness and falls. And fall is a dramatic event in an older uh, person's lives. Changes the type of food uh, eaten, which is really happening can trigger the compensation of medical conditions, just to make an example, her failure. And then the reduction of cognitive stimulation. That cognitive stimulation that we receive just from our normal life, just from being outside, can have an impact on cognitive performance. And, and the literature is quite uh, sure here is showing that loneliness at baseline is a predictor in older people of accelerated cognitive decline uh, over time, independent of other health condition and independent of depression. Now I'm ending here my uh, first long uh, part of my, of my talk to give some time to talk to you about some uh, research uh, initiatives that are uh, basically trying to increase our knowledge about the impact of the pandemic on non-COVID-19 patients, and also trying to increase our knowledge, as, uh, as Parminder was saying, about potential solutions to try to minimize this impact during this pandemic and in future similar situations. And I intentionally call the second part of my, of my talk as research opportunities, because I really think that the COVID-19 pandemic with all the bad that is leading is also uh, giving us uh, opportunities. And I'm starting uh, uh, showing, uh, sharing with you a screenshot of my um, email uh, uh, inbox. I received this email on April 24th, 2020. And that was the note of uh, uh, funding opportunities coming from the Canadian Institutes of, of Research uh, of health research, sorry. This is actually the second call uh, about funding opportunities to support COVID-19 uh, research that we have been uh, receiving. And so that email was sent on April 24th and the deadline submission, the, the line for submission of the grant application was May 11th. So a little bit longer than two weeks. This is crazy, this would never happen in other uh, circumstances. And this is just to say, not only, just not only like to share with you the craziness of our lives in the past two, two uh, in the past one, two months, but also to emphasize the efforts that the government is, uh, is, uh, is doing to try to support uh, researchers to find answers to, to our questions. The first study I'm gonna talk to you about is a randomized control trial whose um, title is PVC-RAM, and PVC-RAM stays for post-discharge after surgery virtual care with remote automated monitoring. And it's a, a study led by PJ Devereaux and Michael McGillian, so I'm not the principal investigator, but I'm fully and happily involved in the, in the trial. And the trial is focusing on a particular non-COVID-19 vulnerable population. 
who is actually patients that are undergoing surgery during these times because their surgery is a non-elective surgery, is a semi-urgent, urgent, or emergency surgery. And this specific type of patient population is known to be at substantial risk, as high as 25%, so one in four, of going back to the emergency department, to urgent cares, or being readmitted because of some complications during the 30, the 30 days after uh, their discharge from the hospital. And normally what happens with this patient is that notwithstanding this known high risk, because this is what the system can effort, patients are then typically seen after discharge by their physician after two to six weeks, more often six weeks. And these timelines may be even longer during the COVID-19 pandemic. So what we are really trying to do in this trial is to compare our virtual care intervention to what is uh, uh, standard care, which is what I, I just uh, described, to see if the uh, virtual care intervention using remote automatic monitoring, and I'm gonna explain to you what I mean with that, is definitely reducing the risk of acute hospital care during the 30 days after, after the uh, non-elective surgeries. And the intervention that we are uh, testing um, uh, here uh, in the trial, as, as the, the, the picture is showing, is, uh, it does include a human component and a technology component. The human component is mainly represented by nurses, the, our PVC RAM nurses, that from a nurse station that is located close to the Hamilton General Hospital, are following these patients every day with daily assessment over the phone or on a, a video conference. The second piece of the human uh, component, is somebody like me, so I'm involved in, this, in the study. I'm actually on call for the study and I had to ask a colleague of mine to cover myself because I, I uh, receive call, call at any time. And the role of the physician is really to jump in, to intervene when care, sorry, care is escalated to them. And then there is the, the, the technology component, and I'm showing you this, this picture. The technology component is what is allowing for remote uh, monitoring. So there is a tablet, which is actually the way we are in constant contact with our patient. And this is the tablet that we are using um, uh, for our video conferences. It's also the tablet that is capturing the data from uh, about the patient vitals and the patient uh, measures, uh, measures its vitals or their vitals using different devices for what I, what I mean with vitals, blood pressure, uh, heart beats, temperature, oxygen saturation, and also, also uh, weight, body weight. So there is also a scale that is connected to, to uh, the technology. And I do think that the human piece, the human component of the intervention uh, plays a, a huge, a huge role. And, and, and I'm not talking about myself. I'm now taking the opportunity to really uh, mention the efforts of every of my colleagues, not only in this trial, but even outside the trial that is now involved in some virtual care provision, trying to really uh, change, translate, uh, rethink our uh, clinical practice from an in-person assessment to a, a, a virtual to virtual follow-ups and what we are used to say is really that we are learning medicine again but i also want to emphasize the technology component i do think that the technology is playing a huge role here as well and i'm going back to the second story that i uh, 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 told you at the beginning of my talk about my virtual uh, patient okay the reason why you remember i had the perception that the patient was not feeling well that day is because actually the patient which uh, who was actually uh, 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 on his second day post discharge so only the second day post discharge measured his vitals and he had a heart rate of 32 BPM, which is an extremely low heart rate, still compatible with life, but an extremely low heart rate. And the patient was completely technically asymptomatic. He was not having any complaint. And actually when I was talking over the phone with the patient's wife, the patient's wife was kind of 
minimizing. Say, I think he feels okay. He seems fine. He just needs to rest. And that same day, I uh, uh, sent the patient to the hospital. The patient was admitted with a complete heart block. And the patient probably would have died. The second study I'm talking uh, uh, to you about is not a trial, so I'm not testing any intervention. It's what we call observation study. And its uh, name is called Telesearch. And it's a study that I am uh, leading. And again, this is the study with which I'm trying to respond to that a question for which I didn't have answer. I do not have an answer um, uh, right now. And uh, one of the primary objectives of this study is really to try to understand the impact of the pandemic on a vulnerable population, which is specifically 65 years old or older uh, people that have seen their surgery deferred because of COVID-19. So they're waiting for the surgery in this COVID-19 era. So I really hope to capture with the study the effects of all, all the three mechanisms I, I have been talking about. The other objective, which is still a primary objective, objective of my study, is to study the impact of surgery itself on cognitive and physical uh, performance of these patients, of these older patients that are eventually undergoing surgery. And this is where, I mean, this is where really uh, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic has been giving me an opportunity of understanding more about this. So I've been studying the impact of surgery on what we call neurocognitive outcomes and physical function of our older patients for uh, a few years uh, now. And unfortunately so far, we did experience some limitations. So far, the way we would study the impact of surgery on, for example, cognitive performance is that we would test the patient that we knew would undergo surgery in a few days or even the same day with some cognitive testing to measure uh, their uh, cognitive performance. Then the patient undergoes surgery. And then I see the patient, I follow up the patients again sometime after surgery, for example, one year after surgery, and they see a change in their uh, cognitive performance of using the same type of, of tool for assessment. And so I would consider the impact of surgery that delta change, okay? However, with this type of design, what I'm doing, I'm just really drawing a line between two points and measuring a change that has occurred over time after the patient had uh, uh, had their surgery. However, these are older patients with many uh, other chronic conditions. And so I don't really know if that change is different from what the patient would have experienced even without surgery. So now the opportunity th that the COVID-19 pandemic is really giving me is that now I do have patients that were technically surgical candidates, but because of the lockdown, have been waiting for the surgery. So now what I'm able to do is really to follow these patients before they undergo surgery, assess these patients multiple times to draw a trajectory of their function, cognitive function, for example. So then from this preoperative trajectory, I can really project a line to one year, which would represent, would give me what would be the patient cognitive performance at one year if that preoperative trajectory continued and changed. Then the patient does undergo surgery. Most of these patients will undergo surgery. And then I'm following the patient uh, after surgery. And again, I'm following the patient over time. And then what it's really, the, and then I, I will again see the patient uh, 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 one year, for example, after, after surgery, but even before that. And now I will detect a new cognitive uh, uh, performance. Now the real impact of surgery is now not the entire change, but is the, the difference from the actual cognitive performance and what I would expect in that patient without surgery. Now I'm concluding here my talk and I'm finishing up with this, with this uh, slide. Before coming, going to the slide, I really uh, need to say that I just made a, made a, uh, give you a, gave you a, a couple of examples of uh, research projects that have been um, going on these days. But as Parminder uh, has said, actually there are so many other very relevant studies on older people conducted by Mira colleagues and other, and other colleagues that I couldn't talk about uh, tonight. 
And then, and then so coming back to this last slide, in this last slide, I'm giving you the, the reference for a very interesting article, The Untold Toll, The Pandemic's Effects on Patients Without COVID-19, which is including some of what I have reported to you today. And it also includes this uh, closing that I'm now reading to you. The need for vigilance about viral transmission did not to detract from an equally important message. COVID or no COVID, we are still here to care for you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mara. Excellent talk. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. And um, I, I just wanted to say these days, when you put up the slide from CIHR and all the funding calls that are coming, that it seems like every health researcher or any other researcher here at McMaster or all across the country are, have become COVID-19 researchers. So everybody's working in this space because it is an important uh, issue. I also wanted to just put your presentation a bit in perspective. And that is that uh, we, our healthcare system here in Ontario and across the country and across the globe prepared for the worst case scenario. We were fortunate in Canada that worst case scenario did not materialize, but there were other countries like Italy or US or New York City that had serious consequences because of the uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection. And so I want to make sure the people who are listening to us here today, that some of these surges or these uh, worst case scenarios we were expecting didn't happen because what everybody did, social distancing, physical distancing, and, and staying and, and sort of preventing the spread of infection in the population, especially in older people living in their own homes and communities. Long-term care is a different story. So my question before we sort of get back to the audiences for question, I would like to ask a couple of questions to you. Uh, we know, as I said, that the social distancing and physical distancing has had a major, major impact. I know some of your audience here today are probably trying to figure out how they're gonna go get a haircut. Can they go to a barber tomorrow? <laughs> so my, my message to all of them is take your time. Another week or two, we will have opportunity to do all of that. Uh, before we really get rid of this uh, awful disease. But let's say what you talked about and the non-COVID consequences, not COVID patient consequences we have seen, uh, just because parts of it was physical distance, social distancing, public health measures, lockdown, do you think this could have been done any way differently to achieve what we achieved in relation to uh, COVID-19 and at the same time not have the other negative consequences that you talked about in especially in older people or vulnerable populations? For me there is a very interesting question is a and that uh, doesn't have a real answer. I don't have a real answer to that so I uh, the answer is I don't know. What I, what I uh, can uh, definitely tell is that as you said these measures worked some way worked we we don't have I'm, I'm used to do trials control trials we don't have a comparison we don't know what would have happened if we had not uh, adopted these measures but eventually the outcome is that things have gone much better than he expected and what I and I don't want to blame of course the, our, our policy makers that did the, 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 their, their best a couple of things. So I, while preparing the, the, this talk, I, I ran into a very interesting article that was talking exactly about, about this. So could have been, could, could have we uh, done this differently without imposing, for example, social distancing? And they answered this question during a simulation study. So they simulated a pandemic is a study that involved um, hundreds of, of people. I'm expecting many not, not really older people, but hundreds of, hundreds of people. They, and they were asked to 
interact with the scheme that was simulating a pandemic. And what they observe is that actually a spontaneous social distancing is happening because it's still part of the risk avoidance behaviors, right? However, based on their simulation, and that based on their simulation, that social, the spontaneous social distancing did work a bit to uh, flatten the, 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 the peak of the pandemic, but it didn't work that well. So for sure, we do need other measures. We can't only rely on people's risk attitudes or people, people understanding of, of, of the pandemic. And the other thing that I, uh, two other things. The other thing that I really think, unfortunately, is that I think that in, uh, in this situation, many, many other situations in micro and uh, micro and macro level, actually we need a lesson to learn for next time. So I do think that we did our best and then we probably have the opportunity using a word that I've been using, I've been using many times in my talk, we have the opportunity now to understand, to do better, maybe better next, uh, next time. And the third piece is that unfortunately, the pandemic was unequal from different perspectives. So let's, let's not talk about US, that maybe could be a different, a different uh, piece of, 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 of the picture, but let's talk about Italy, other countries in Europe and worldwide. These are countries where they have seen the, uh, the greatest numbers of the pandemics and where colleagues like me didn't have so much time to do research and at the same time, their countries would be poorer and they didn't have so much funding opportunities as we have had. So unfortunately, what has been happening is that the research on COVID-19, as you're saying, all these COVID-19 researchers are working in countries that have not, not necessarily may, may be the, the, the countries mostly affected by the, by the pandemic. But you, you made an interesting observation here, and that is that the simulation study that you uh, talked about, it showed some effect on flattening of the curve, but not beyond that. But there are some, and you said, we don't have a randomized control trial of comparison, but there are some natural experiments that are happening around the world. Sweden, for example, did not do a similar level of lockdown, let's say, as we did in Canada. There was a, different level of lockdown that happened in Netherlands. And we do see some differences in the way the infection actually occurred, and especially the death rate. In Sweden, death rate is quite high in comparison to, let's say, what we has happened in Canada, even though 80 to 85 percent of deaths in Canada are in the long-term care. And similar pattern we are seeing in other countries as well. So, do you think that we are not generating some interesting new way of looking evidence that might never be available in this setting through these controlled experiments, but the natural experiments actually give us clue what's actually happening. And one of your mentors actually just published a paper this week in Lancet, uh, Holger Schoenemann, who is the member of faculty here, where he looked at all the published literature and his conclusions or their team's conclusion was that social distancing, physical distancing, use a mask actually helped curtail the pandemic. So my question related to this comment is, if you are a, if, let's say if there's a new pandemic starting and, and you are asked to help policymakers in Ottawa or in Toronto to the Ontario Ministry, what would you tell them to prevent or reduce, uh, uh, prevent the infection and at the same time uh, reduce this risk avoidance behavior? What would you tell them? How would you guide them? Because that's, on one hand, we don't have evidence. We are generating evidence, but policymakers are looking for evidence to help them inform what they should do. So what would you tell them based on what you have looked at so far? So assuming that they will listen to me, <laughs> so I, um, I do think maybe it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a too easy answer. Probably what I would say to them is just to do exactly what they did, to do exactly the same type of capacity planning, the same type of 
very early adoption of these measures because they really worked. At the same time, since the impact of the pandemic on non-COVID-19 patients, we don't really have a full understanding of that. I would ask them, please wait for the studies to come out. And in the meantime, try just to assume that there will be consequences on that. So we should probably just uh, strengthen the possible uh, solutions. Uh, the, the, we, we should anticipate some of this impact and try to uh, focus also our efforts to the consequences of the pandemic, not necessarily related to the infection itself. Great. Thank you, Mara. Uh, in the interest of the time, I'm going to uh, sort of open it up for question and answers from the uh, audience. And we have already uh, three, three questions that are in front of me. And I'm also getting some messages through other means saying that lighting where I'm sitting is not very good so people can't see me. I hope it is a little better now. Um, one of the questions I'm trying to figure out how to maneuver this uh, uh, question answer. Uh, okay, so there is a one question that uh, came from a colleague here at, uh, uh, in Hamilton, respiratory physician. And uh, he would like to hear from, your, from you we often talk, there are three questions, so I will focus on each question individually and then go on to okay. the second one. We often talk about personalized medicine, yet we gave everyone the same advice. Stay at home, even if you're mildly ill, try to stay at home, stay away from hospital. Do you think that our advice should have been more nuanced for elderly and vulnerable patients? So the answer is yes, it would have been ideal. Maybe, maybe it was difficult to do something like that. I do think that what my colleague is saying is true on average, but I do think that also each of us that have been working on the field have really tried to do their best to individualize their, their uh, uh, advice. This is what I've been doing and I think also other colleagues have been doing. When I'm reaching out to my patients, I always try to take into consideration what patient I have in front of me. When I talk to my parents, I always take into consideration, consideration who I have in front of me uh, and same with my friends. So I do think that we're doing our best to make an individualized uh, capacity planning I think it's going to be very difficult, but we should think of that in the next pandemic. <laughs> Second question from the same questionnaire. Families often provide medical, social, and psychological support to older patients. Our social distancing message effectively removed that support. How do we readdress this balance in the future? Or if we have a second surge, let's say this fall or in the winter, so I do think that if we have a second surge right now, so the same people that have experienced the surge are then again experiencing the same kind of situation, we, this, even the older people, they will be more ready because they will be more familiar with our uh, telecommunication tools. They will definitely feel the distancing less than at this time, this first uh, wave of, of infection on this, uh, this first uh, lockdown. So I think that we have uh, done our best to try to try to fill that physical gap with what we 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 had in in in, in uh, available. And I and I think that this this uh, works. So I'm a uh, Italian living in Canada, and I'm still keeping my uh, social uh, closeness. To, with, with, my, with my parents. So I think this is challenging. Technology is not for everybody. So if the next pandemic is happening 10 years from now, of course we will have new people that, to, to whom we have to teach about this. And maybe we can anticipate and try to use these uh, telecommunications tools kind of uh, 
uh, in advance and, and, and better. Yeah, and also maybe the, the, the personalized uh, advice could also uh, play a, a role. But I think there is a bit more nuance to that question. I have a very good colleague of mine whose mother is in a, was in an institutional setting doing reasonably well, even though the, the family members were not able to visit, but there was a, some sort of a contact. There was an outbreak in that particular long-term care. The person, the, the family member had to be moved to a different floor for the safety reasons because the person had early signs of dementia, the change in surroundings, change in environment, actually deteriorated and created lots of challenges for the individual and that had to be moved to the hospital. Once the person moved to the hospital, that the family members who were even virtually or, or standing outside the window providing that support system disappeared because they were not able to communicate through nurses or physicians to know what was happening. And it escalated the deterioration to the point that this patient will never recover to their pre-movement level. So this, this, is, this is happening fair bet. And I think uh, many of us have not sort, sort of sorted out how would we manage this in the future because uh, just a virtual care won't do it. It will, we will probably have to learn to create our narrow family bubbles that allow you to provide the care and the consistency one has to provide in this context. It's challenging. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's very, very difficult. Uh, there was I, another I, thing. I agree. I, what, just what I want to add is that maybe, maybe the, the, there is where there is the place for an individualized uh, decision. And maybe for that specific person to be with some family member would be mm -hmm. more important if and the, t the risk would be taken. Yes. Um, there was another question uh, from this uh, questionnaire, but I will skip to go to some others. Uh, there's a question from uh, Spencer Naylor. We have heard a lot about the sad stories from long-term care homes, but what about home care? Should we be equally concerned about home care patients and their vulnerability to COVID-19. Any thoughts on that? They should. We should, sorry. They are, unfortunately, this is also part of my experience. Uh, at the beginning of this capacity planning, we have been talking to our patients, that they, especially when I would discharge a patient, that they would not, uh, they, they didn't have to worry too much because essential services w w won't, be, uh, won't be actually uh, delayed or canceled. And actually this happened because then uh, uh, home service uh, emergency, what we call like emergency nurses, people that are going to somebody's place when that somebody is, is in the middle of a crisis, of a medical crisis, a social crisis, that those people would not go to, to patients' houses. So definitely I think uh, we have seen a similar pandemic, a similar uh, consequence as in the long-term care. Probably we are talk about that a little, a little bit less. Yeah. Okay. Another question that we have, how would you propose quantifying? This must be a question from a researcher. How would you propose quantifying? It's a sample size population. <laughs> <laughs> how would you propose quantifying the impact of increased loneliness and social isolation on psychological health of older adults? I think I was alluding to that in my, in my uh, presentation. I think the third mechanism I was talking about uh, is definitely play the, at least the 60% of the impact. Because it's also, it's also universal, right? It's not really related to the fact that somebody's experience or deferral of a specific service, or if somebody has some urgent uh, medical condition uh, or whether it's not going to emerge. The social distancing and the, fossil, the physical dis distancing is impacting everybody, is impacting probably myself, is impacting ourselves and more likely older people. Uh, there's another question uh, from Michael Dennis. Do you believe there have been health impacts on elderly patients due to isolation? You already talked about that. They feel not only in the community, but also when admitted to hospital, i.e., 
only one or no family members being able to visit. For example, for example, at some hospital, no visitors are allowed for patients who are inpatient units or in the emergency room. And I think I gave the example of my colleague uh, earlier on how that has impacted the, 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 this social distancing and, and physical distancing in hospital settings. But any additional thoughts on that? I think this is the saddest piece of this pandemic, I have to be honest. It's a struggle every day. Our patients are asking us to see their families. And what the answer that we give is that it's not my decision, it's a manager's decision. And this is so sad that you don't have control of this. You try to explain the reasons, but I have to be honest, sometimes I don't feel the reason to be so convincing. Mm -hmm. So I've been struggling a lot uh, uh, with this. And we're not talking about only COVID-19 patients. We're talking about every patient that is hospitalized these days. Okay. Um, there's another question. I teach technology to seniors and I'm working remotely with my clients. I'm noticing a decline in many of my people, particularly those who are in senior residences and confined to their suites. Any suggestions to help improve their health and well-being? So I think that there, there have been some initiatives to try to uh, offer some uh, 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 support, some company to continue to offer some stimulation, the cognitive stimulation that I was talking uh, uh, about to uh, older people in different, ty different types of settings, but still maintaining, respecting the, the social and, and physical distancing. It could be also the, the setting in which we are trying, we like a computerized cognitive stimulation, cognitive therapy. This is something that has been used in other settings, not necessarily in the context of the COVID-19 epidemic, but I'm sure that is being study also studied also in the context of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. So do, when, of course, and we are again talking about situations which family is not allowed in or there, there's no uh, physical in-person support. Okay. Another question is regarding the conversation about nuanced recommendations. What recommendations would you give to informal caregivers, what the questionnaire means, uh, family, friends, and et cetera. What about those types of caregivers what, that are also considered essential staff? What type of a, a recommendation or, or, or uh, advice one would have given to the informal caregivers who are actually carrying the lion's share of care for many of the older people uh, living at home or living in even institutional settings. So those were left out of this picture completely as if they were sidebar to this whole equation. So as a physician, you probably talk to many of these caregivers. How would you have handled or what kind of recommendation you would have given to the Minister of Health in Ontario to manage that uh, disconnect? So Again, unfortunately, there's no one, I think, unit answer. So if I had to make recommendations, my recommendations would look like, please consider these points when you are talking to your, uh, your uh, patient's family or to your friend's family or whoever. Consider who is the, the subject, okay? What is the subject risk of uh, being sick because of the COVID-19 infection, suffering from social distancing, Okay, and the of course the daily need needs of this specific person. So what uh, what is the uh, if this, this person is suffering from this, for disabilities? If they need care, if they need care in, in some of the for example daily activities of uh, the activities of daily uh, livings. And then I would say also consider what what is the the family member we are talking about. So what is the type of job that this family member uh, is, uh, is doing? What is the, the risk of this family member of being exposed to COVID-19? COVID and so these are all, I would take into consideration, this is what I actually do, I do take into consideration these different aspects to individualize my, my advice as much as possible. And this is what I'm doing also, again, not only with my patients, but also with in, in our informal conversations with people that are asking me for advice. Thank you. There's another question. Uh, 
current situation is an opportunity to advance personalized medicine. But how do we even know what is needed by individual members of the community and how do we reach them to do such research? So I think these are two different questions. So I, I try to answer the first question. So, um, so the thing, this is what exactly I was trying to say in my, in my talk is that we don't have the specific answers. So what's happening, who is in more a need during a pandemic, like a COVID-19 pandemic, we don't have these, these answers yet. I mean, the last pandemic that has been affected the world is like decades ago and the age composition of our uh, worldwide population was not the current one. So we don't really know. We can't learn from historical data coming from similar situations like the COVID-19 pandemic, but we can try to learn from what we have. So what this is actually what I've been trying to collect while preparing my talk. So indirect evidence from somewhere else, assuming as the capacity planning that we are, these are the best evidence available and based on this best evidence, we, we, uh, we can maybe, we can try to, uh, to, to have a personalized approach. The second piece of the question is that how do we approach these patients, uh, these, uh, these people, not necessarily uh, patients in this social distance, physical distancing area. And this is what we are actually trying to figure out. And we figured out some way, and, it, and we figured out some way, not only because of our efforts, but because of a community, scientific community efforts. So our uh, ethics boards have been approving studies that are only based on verbal consent, so that we don't have to be in contact with our patients, with our people. And, and this is a big change. I mean, in, in different circumstances, they would say no for no reason, but we would say no, they would have said no. So that means that there is, there is a college of effort to uh, make things happen more smoothly, even in such different circumstances. The study I was talking about, the second study, the quota research is all happening remotely. And you can make these things um, uh, happen with a little bit of effort. Uh, effort. We might see a little bit of discrimination and disadvantages. I, I agree because it's possible that we are not able to reach out to every type of population in terms of age, in terms of geographical uh, uh, location, in terms of ethnicity, in terms of social status. So my, uh, the, the study, cultural research study is based on, uh, on a computerized cognitive assessment to make things more feasible. However, I can't reach out to people that do not have a computer or a tablet or a, a son having a computer or a tablet. So uh, it's possible still with some, with some limitations. I think I will just add a thing that it also highlights, uh, we, we have talked about the hospital care and delivering care to individualized patients. But one thing this COVID-19 has taught us that most of as a society, we had forgotten how important public health is. Uh, and, and public health is a population strategy. How do we keep population healthy? How do we keep groups of people healthy? And I remind many of my friends and colleagues and relatives who have difficulty paying taxes to the government that those taxes do go to the right type of activities when you talk about public health. Public health is like insurance. You hope you never need it, but when you need it, you hope it is there. And I think that the example that we have around the world in front of us, the countries that have strong public health systems did actually very well. The countries that had destroyed their public health systems did very poorly. And so it is a balance of personalized individualized care with what we need to do from a population perspective as well. Um, there was another question here. How can we help ensure the adoption of tools and techniques like remote use of medical sensors and virtual visits of doctors and nurses and greater collaboration among physicians after this situation becomes normalized? Individual physicians have previously been less than eager to adopt new initiatives? So I think things have already changed. We won't, get, we won't, we won't uh, go back to what 
life, doctor's life was before. We now experience that we could do it, that we can uh, virtually follow patients. We experience even the, the oldest, most reluctant physician that doesn't want to use technology now and knows how to use technology. So, and we are experiencing the benefits. I'm just making an example, very easy example. So I follow my patients postoperatively quite close to their surgery. So in a normal daily, uh, uh, in a normal day of my post-op clinic, I have in my schedule, six, seven patients, 50% do not show up because of their older patients. They are like a close to their surgery. They don't want to come. Now in my virtual visits, 100% of patients respond to my calls. So we are experiencing the advantages. We are also experiencing the challenges, but we are leaving the challenges. We are learning from the challenges. So I don't think we will go back to what we were, where we were before. I think we won't forego the, the, what we learned so far. There's a uh, question from an anonymous attendee. It says, thank you, Dr. Marcucci, for this great, great presentation. I'm an undergraduate student at McMaster University, and I'm curious about how you're collecting the data for your studies with social distancing guidelines and also considering the special demographics of your participants. So, uh, I mean, there could be different, different ways of collecting data. For example, in uh, our specific uh, study, two studies uh, I've been uh, talking about, if that how implies what matter of data collection or uh, using what, like with, with uh, human resources, I'm trying to, to answer both questions. So in terms of what, what method, so we are assessing patients or, or over the phone and for, for, for different types of assessment, like the functional assessment in the second study, also uh, asking, uh, collecting quest, uh, um, data about their, any intercurrent uh, clinical events. We do have health records that we can access from which we can obtain some, some data. Then specifically for the virtual care uh, monitoring study, uh, we are also collecting data from the technology itself, okay? And in terms of what human resources, uh, I have to say that these times have been definitely unprecedented for the efforts that the researchers have, uh, have been asked for, as Perminder was saying, with all, like, all these grants opportunities, the short deadlines, but we have been also uh, supported by the fact that there were um, many people, and I'm telling who the people are, that have been available, more available, available than before, uh, uh, to help our research uh, projects. And I'm talking about undergraduate students, and maybe that, that was where the, the, the student was alluding to. And uh, uh, so undergraduate students that unfortunately have seen their usual classes stopped, medical students that have been uh, uh, moved away from, the, from their uh, clerkship, any kind of students, and also uh, staff that uh, have been redeployed uh, uh, from like a uh, non-essential service and sometimes to research uh, activities. Uh, there are others, um, if I may add to that, in th where you really require to have the physical contact with the participants or a patient to collect data for research. Under certain, certain circumstances, universities are allowing that type of research, provided you have taken all the precautions, you have all the PPEs, you have all the uh, uh, structures in place to make sure that there is no chance of infection in that situation. So there are a wide variety of tools that people are using. They, are, they have to be exceptional circumstances to, to collect such data, but there are ways to do it right now. Yeah, and the other uh, thing that I, we forgot, sorry, I mean, we both forgot is the use of administrative data. We, you can yeah. use administrative data to respond to many of these questions actually. There's a question, what do you do about prescriptions for physiotherapy or occupational therapy or other physical activity programs uh, to maintain pain and health that require in-person contact? How does that happen in this circumstance? So I answered the second question, how does it happen now? It happens less, unfortunately. So uh, it's true that these uh, this is a type of service that unfortunately has been affected a little bit by the, the, the capacity planning for obvious reasons. How do I try to still uh, obtain something? 
on one side, I struggle. I call people. I try to understand if I can run something. If there, because I mean, the the, the uh, physiotherapy, for uh, for example, can be can be offered in different ways from the community, from from like a home care, from uh, different initiatives that have been uh, actually still. Uh, uh, still uh, going on uh, uh, these these times, and there is also family. So family can be involved, can be taught how to do something to help uh, uh, their their uh, uh, relatives, especially in those circumstances in which there 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 has been an agreement to keep the the physical closeness, uh, even in such circumstances. So we are really trying to look at different types of uh, resources to maintain. Uh, such a type of, of help for, for our people. Uh, this is the last question before we end today's session. Uh, what comment is about many of Ontario's long-term care homes seem to have mismanaged the outbreak in their facilities. Uh, there was also a lack of available PPE. Staff are afraid to come to work in some cases. Do you have any thoughts on what a model long-term care uh, home would look like in the future? That's a hard question. <laughs> it's a very hard question. And, and so if the question is that how like a long-term care model could be in order to prevent a similar type of disaster, let's say in, a, in, a, in the future, uh, it's very difficult. I also uh, um, think that uh, there may be differences across uh, 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 long-term uh, cares. Uh, you know, now that I that we are, as I mentioned, we are being experiencing the advantages of uh, virtual care. I wonder whether, like a mix, a mixed model in which we are trying to uh, reduce contact every time we can from the outside and the inside of the long-term uh, cares will probably work better. So we don't know exactly the, the dynamics of why these outbreaks have been happening, but definitely the COVID-19, uh, the, the virus was not growing. It was, it was not born in the, in the long-term care. It was brought from outside. So we need to think probably of a model, uh, assuming that that was the main mechanism. And I think I'll add to that, uh, to before we finish, that the inequities we saw, the reasons we saw these in outbreaks in long-term care didn't just happen during the COVID-19. They existed many years prior to it. And they were neglected by the politicians and the, and the governments all across the country. Uh, two years ago, there was a fire in Quebec, long-term care, where 50 of them died. Nothing changed after that. And same thing in many of the places, there was a mass murder in, many of the long, in one of the long-term cares in Ontario. A lot of recommendations and changes were suggested, nothing changed. I think there is a complete overhaul that has to happen. Uh, they, they also have to think about consistency in staff. Right now, personal support workers go, they are paid minimal and they go from uh, long-term care to another. They're working at multiple places to make minimum uh, living. Uh, I think, and as a society, I think we have to rethink, is that what we want to do with our older relatives to put them in long-term care facility when it is convenient for us? Uh, I think there might be a better model. Many of these services can still be given at home, people living on their own if there's a strong home care services available, then we don't have all the nuances and bureau bureaucratic barriers we have for approval of those services. I think the whole thing has to change. It's not just the long-term care, the way we look at home care and we, the way we look at uh, older people in our society. We live in a very ageist society. And, and I think unless that changes, nothing will change. It is not just, it is a symptom of a whole bunch of things that are not right in our society that we will have to rethink and revisit. And, and I think COVID-19 uh, is in a way shining the light on those inequities uh, in our communities and our neighborhoods. So with that, Maura, I want to thank you for taking time to come and talk to us. I know this has been a very busy time for you. We all appreciate it. 
and this was a wonderful talk. And, and the message to all the listeners here, here is that we all have to work together. First and foremost, we have to get rid of this pandemic. So we continue to do our bit, which is physical and social distancing. And at the same time, we have to work together to support our family members, our neighbors, our communities to go through this together. Thank you very much and have a good night. Thank you, everybody. Thank Bye. you. Bye, Maura. Bye.